I'm also now joined by Abhishek Aparwal. He's the CEO and founder of Socket AI Labs and Pankaj Mishra, who's a journalist and co-founder of The Factor Daily. Good evening, uh, both of you. Thank you very much for joining us. Pankaj, I'm going to come to you first. You just saw that report. Now, how does Google Gemini stack up against ChatGPT? And do you think that Google will be able to dislodge uh, the first mover advantage that uh, ChatGPT obviously enjoys? Yeah. It's exciting times. Uh, look, I think uh, we have to first understand uh, that chat GPT is the first love for most of the users when it comes to generative AI. So that that's very much is going to hold there. I think we need to look at Gemini through a very different lens. I think we have to understand the aspirations of Google when it comes to Gemini. So what we are talking about is Google looking at a universe of Gmail, Calendar, a map, photos, and so on, uh, to be governed by this layer of Gemini uh, and something that becomes a magic uh, AI tool for a user. Uh, you know, you want to book a hotel room uh, or you're getting late for a meeting. So it is trying to bring all of its applications under this boot of Gemini. Um, ChatGPT, not just early user uh, advantage, but it, it doesn't have this universe of apps the way Google has. Of course, uh, App Store is a work in progress there and we will see more action. But I think the, the key thing to understand here is what is happening, uh, especially from India point of view, and that is there is going to be a land grab when it comes to AI. Uh, we are going to see uh, more models here, uh, which is basically will help them train. I mean, users like you and me, the more we engage with these new launches, uh, it, it gets trained. And uh, the other uh, hunt is also for some use cases. So yeah, overall, I think if Google plays this right, uh, it, it, it will definitely do much better. It could do a lot better because now it's frustrating to be honest, and it is learning at our expense. Uh, uh, Pankaj, also, you know, how much of a game changer will be Gemini's language capabilities be? You know, because that is the big news point that we are getting today, that it's being launched in nine Indian languages. Uh, obviously, you know, Google is looking to expand its footprint in India by offering this. Look, I think Google already has been doing a lot when it comes to languages, Indian languages. Now, like I mentioned, they, it, this has become a holy grail. Uh, and India offers that diversity of languages. So that is why you are seeing, you know, we, we learned about Sarvam uh, AI, uh, you know, doing its things. And now, now Google, uh, because the world of non-English languages has a massive, uh, you know, growth potential. So, so there is going to be a land grab here. Uh, I, I, I don't think it is an advantage so far because I think there are lots of other players who are already deeply engaged. Uh, you have uh, OpenAI, Microsoft uh, going on, and, and and Google. So early days, but but I don't think it's it's an advantage uh, yet. All right, uh, let's also bring in Abhishek now. Abhishek, uh, you know, the one stumbling block for generative AI models like this one is sourcing data in different languages and also training these models to understand the nuances of various Indian languages. So tell us a bit more about how this can be bridged and what is currently happening. Hi, Nupur, and thanks for inviting me. So uh, when it comes to uh, Indian languages, uh, it is typically seen that we don't have that much data as compared to uh, languages, say, for example, English right now on the internet. And most of these models are essentially trained on the data uh, which we have scrapped from the entire internet. And uh, we have not written that much content on any of these Indian languages uh, till this point. So just statistically, I think the internet is filled with close to 80-90% uh, English dominating data. Uh, and uh, rest of the languages of the world are represented only with like say 10-15% of the entire internet. So that's the bias. Uh, now the issue is that uh, all these models, these are very large scale models and to train them, you require a lot of data. And uh, the field of LLM, large language models, require a lot of text-based data uh, to get to any sort of performance of these models. So hence, uh, these models by default started with English or the open AI effort that happened and now the efforts are being moving towards Indian languages, but the biggest barrier is access to data and that sort of data which is required to train these models. So a lot of effort is now going into, instead of just scrapping the data from the internet and uh, then training Indic models, 
I think we can't uh, uh, afford to wait for internet to uh, generate that kind of data. Uh, I think a lot of entities are now going ahead and started to generate synthetic data. So that is one of the techniques to train these large scale model well, uh, where we either do translations, we do validation on top of these translations, or we actually use an existing model, say any of these open source model, which allow or which gave us the license to generate a lot of synthetic data in the same Indic language and then utilizing that particular data to train a new model. So that effort has also been uh, happening now, yeah. Right, uh, uh, if I could come back to you, uh, you know, Pankaj, on, um, uh, in terms of user experience, who do you think has the edge? Because obviously, uh, a person who's downloading Gemini on his phone or you know on his computer is going to ask, what is it that Gemini can offer me that chat GPT doesn't? That's a tricky question, I'll be honest, right? I mean, see, when you, if you look at the conversational capability of chat GPT versus Gemini, <laughs> chat GPT is superior. I mean, no doubt. I mean, at least from my experience, when it comes to uh, having conversations, chat GPT is better. I think where, where Google is, is aiming for is its universe. And, and that's the key point, because when it comes to user interface, Google has this history of user journeys with it, you know, whether uh, it's Gmail or Google Map or Calendar and so on. So I think Google is betting on that universe. It has existing user behavior. Uh, you know, users are addicted to using, you know, all of us use Google Map or Google Calendar and so on. So it is banking on that. So you are right. I mean, I think user... Um, interfaces are going to be an important uh, battlefront here. Uh, but if, if Google uh, messes this up, then I think it, it's it's a it's a field open for anyone to disrupt. And we are going to see a lot of uh, new features and products coming from OpenAI. Microsoft Copilot 2 is uh, headed in that direction. All right now, Abhishek, you know, for a country as large as India and as diverse and as, uh, you know, digitally divisive as India, uh, what LLMs like yours are doing is to be able to help bridge that digital device. So in that sense, they play a very, very critical role uh, so that we are able uh, essentially uh, to bridge not just that divide, but also enhance inclusivity. There are other things that the government would want uh, to happen. How do you see that progressing in, say, the next two years? So uh, rightly said, uh, for a country like India, I think it's very important uh, to look if we have to make AI available and accessible to everyone, I think it's important to look at the cost factor too. India is a very price sensitive market. If you have to build anything on top of uh, Gen AI, essentially we have to bring down the cost for inference uh, at the end. And uh, uh, then only the cost would trickle down to use case specific implementations that are happening. So what we are doing at Socket AI Labs is looking at uh, ultimately how do we build intelligence, but keeping the form factor which is the smallest one. If we keep the form factor to the smallest one, essentially uh, these are small language models which are trained to do very specialized things. And once they are trained to do specialized things, you won't be able to, uh, like you don't need essentially open AI's big models to do something as simple as summarizing a text or generating something which, which is very, very specific. So we have to move into that particular category where inference is less expensive or even inference cost is totally eliminated. So for example, uh, I think Apple did an amazing job where they included an on-device uh, large language model. It will be available in all iOS devices uh, in our MacBooks pretty soon. And uh, that is essentially just reducing or eliminating the cost of inference. And uh, that is also pretty amazing when it comes to doing inference because it's way faster as compared to me uh, talking to chat GPT, taking sort of latency to send my data, get a response. Uh, and definitely these small language models won't be as smart as big models that are out there, but uh, uh, most of the workload can be offloaded to these smaller models at very negligible cost on device. And then for heavy lifting task, I think open models will still dominate where you would uh, send a request to OpenAI or send a request to Gemini to do more complicated things. Now but last, again, uh, right, Abhishek, quick question now. There are obviously a lot of firms that are going to try and make way in this now. What is it that is going to be your differentiating factors from the others? You know, uh, we just had Pankaj mention uh, uh, Sarvam, there's Kutram. So there is a lot of competition and innovators will want to, uh, you know, uh, want to share in this pie. So what is it that a company can do to distinguish itself? Oh, that's that's pretty amazing question. So. Uh, one of the things that we can do, uh, I, I think this is again going back to the question of 
do we have sufficient data to train these models? To be frank, we don't have. If we have to train all these 300 billion or even more sort of model, we don't have that kind of indic data available. But we can do it smartly, right? So uh, how our brain functions is not how uh, most of these LLMs are trained. LLMs are pretty bad at understanding a new language. I essentially have to show the entire corpus of the language, almost the entire corpus of the language to train it in a new language. But our brain has two different uh, fragments. One is one understands the linguistic context and the other one is the knowledge part. So if tomorrow I learn French, I can very easily just use my past knowledge and then uh, retain it and then start conversing in French if I don't know French right now. Uh, maybe something similar approach we have to take where uh, we segregate the knowledge part from the intelligence, uh, from the uh, linguistic part. And then uh, the language becomes like an adapter where we keep on adding new languages. We have more than uh, 22 languages and then more than 2000 dialects in India itself. Uh, so this particular approach is very much important. This is something that we are working on right now. And this is more to the fundamental layer where we are looking at different architectures that uh, we should be imp implementing uh, maybe outside the domain of uh, transformer based architectures itself. And this will also require less amount of data and especially for languages uh, which are even low resource within the Indic category itself. So for example, we don't have that much content for Assamese for Kashmiri language. I think Indian languages are also dominated by Hindi and Bangla and uh, most of these languages. But again, we have to cover a larger uh, uh, spectrum when it comes to Indian languages too. So we have to innovate at the foundation layer, at the fundamental layer itself. All right, so exciting times for you, of course, uh, Abhishek and uh, Pankaj, thank you very much uh, for joining us and uh, essentially taking us through what uh, this could mean and the transformation it could bring about. Uh, thank you both of you for joining us.